1993, the PC party went from the largest majority in Canadian history to just two seats. Even Kim Campbell, the country's first female prime minister, lost her own riding. This is the moment in history that is often referred to as the right-wing split. It's a time period that can be denoted between 1993 and 2002, when there were three major right-wing parties. Three? Yes, three. The Bloc Québécois split off while the Reform Party were successful in swallowing up former PC support in Alberta and Saskatchewan. This video will look at as to why the splits happen. Other videos will cover the future of the splitted parties. Trudeau is one of the country's most popular prime ministers, but having said that, he also had a way of dividing the country and using factions against each other to stay in power. Mr. Peckford's unreconciled because he wants jurisdiction over fish. Why have you left him unreconciled? Why have you left uh, the Premier of, uh, of Alberta unreconciled who wants a triple E Senate? Premiers are always going to be unreconciled. They'll always be asking for more. And the job of the Prime Minister of Canada is to say yes on this, I'll trade something for you. If you want to take the notwithstanding clause out of the, out of the charter, well, I'll maybe give you a little more power this, that. But that's what constitution is about. That's what a balanced federation is. In 1970, Trudeau initiated the War Measures Act. Grave crisis. When violent and fanatical men are attempting to destroy the unity and the freedom of Canada. One aspect of that crisis is the threat which has been made on the lives of two innocent men. In 1970, the overwhelming majority of Canadians saw this as being necessary and supported this decision. However, a decade later, many would consider that perhaps military rule wasn't necessary to resolve the crisis, and a government that could simply turn off our freedoms over a terror attack shouldn't be in power. I'm not worried, but you so seem to be. Worry, what's your, I'm, not worried. I'm, I'm worried about living in a town that's uh, full of people with guns running around in it. Are you? Have they done anything to you? Have they pushed you around or anything? They've pushed around friends of mine. Yeah? What were your friends doing? Trying to take pictures of them. Aha! Is that against the law? No, not at all. Well, Does, doesn't it worry you having a town that you've got to resort to this kind of thing? No, it doesn't worry me. I think it's natural that if uh, people are being abducted, uh, that they be protected against such abduction. In the last 45 years since, we haven't used the War Measures Act once. So, when it came time for bringing the Constitution to Canada, it was a bit of a mess. Trudeau wanted to keep the Constitution as was. He felt the role of federal government was to hold all the chips and give some to the provinces in exchange for agreements. Things like the modern health transfer court would likely have been rejected by Trudeau because he preferred to give different things to different provinces. No better of an example of this is the National Energy Plan, which sought to artificially decrease the price of profits and price of Alberta oil for the remainder of the country. If you were from Alberta, you would see this as exporting Albertan dollars to other provinces. Trudeau could afford to lose Alberta as long as he could maintain support in the remainder of Canada. So in 1982, when the Constitution was patriated, only two amendments were made. The first was a wealth transfer payment, so he called have-not provinces, and the second was to include the PC-created Bill of Rights on the cover of the document. Only enough was given to get everyone to sign but dozens of issues were left unaddressed. One issue in particular was the case of protecting Quebec's unique identity. This issue was large for Quebec, that their separatist government refused to sign the document. This sort of politicking kept Trudeau in power longer than most prime ministers, but when he stepped down, it all fell apart. When talking about the right-wing vote split, it's worth mentioning that there has only ever been a giant coalition of conservatives just two times in history. The Johnny McDonald government and the Brian Mulroney government. Any discussions of a united right between this period is nothing but historical falsity. Between 1930 up to 1982, 
there was a right-wing vote split between social credit and P PCs. However, during this time frame, there were three PC prime ministers. The right-wing vote was always split in the country, and the liberal centrist government would also eat into that vote split. Mulroney's coalition is unmatched in the history of Canada. No government has been able to attract so many voters, so many interests, and so many seats. Brian Mulroney's PC party was one that created a tent larger than the country itself. From Western Canada, they attracted disenfranchised prairies who felt wrong and ripped off by the transfers of wealth from the West to the East. These were followers of the social credit, who were deeply social conservatives and felt that morality of the nation was on trial and the liberals were those who were advocates of Satan. Even today, this region is known as Canada's Bible Belt. Driving down the highway, it is not strange to see anti-abortion signs on personal lawns. From the east, Mulroney was capable of convincing libertarians and economic conservatives that his government would shrink the massive budgets of Trudeau. Trudeau, in 1966, started the process of adding universal health care to the country, and the budget was ballooning with many other social costs, while also not getting results. All the while, in the U.S. to the south saw ballooning health care costs passed on directly to the consumer with overall better outcomes. While no one was advocating for American health care, people were advocating for a mixed approach that would allow for some private health care. Today, this is mixed approach is very common in Canada that we don't even associate it with privatization. Reductions in barriers for pharmacies allow for more accessibility for drugs. For example, extra strength Tylenol used to be prescription only. Private clinics and private research clinics were permitted, which led to a lot of treatments being brought to Canada. Mulroney was able to convince all of the economic conservatives that had historically sided with the liberals to turn over to support the PCs. The final part of the Grand Coalition to guarantee Mulroney the largest majority in Canadian history was the vote of the Separatists, or as he preferred to call them, the Nationalists. These were people who gave support to the cause of separation in the 60s, but were willing to give Canada a chance for the right deal. That is to say, they were Nationalists and Quebec was first for them, and everyone else was last. Brian Mulroney had offered a little bit to all of Canadians. And when the time came, the Grand Coalition delivered Brian Mulroney the largest government in Canadian history. With 50% of the popular vote, 211 seats, and a large unprecedented representation across all provinces, it was a coalition that could go nowhere but down. If this coalition was ever going to have a problem, it was going to be rooted in the Social Conservatives of the West and the Nationalists of Quebec. The Social Conservatives wanted to export their morality to the remainder of Canada. They wanted to ban abortion. They wanted to have open and fair party process. They wanted an end to transfer payments and for the provinces to get more of their own money. The Nationalists, on the other hand, were far more socialist and wanted more government program spending. They wanted more federal transfer payments. They wanted to open up the constitution to give the provinces more autonomy. So Mulroney tried both. Mulroney opened up the constitution and he also tried to legislate abortion. Spoiler alert, both failed. With the constitution, Mulroney invited the provinces at Meech Lake to discuss what they want added in and adjusted with the main goal being to get Quebec to sign it. Meech Lake failed largely because of Trudeau. Trudeau had Newfoundland Premier Clyde Wells in the mix, and Wells refused to put the measure to a vote. You can find more on this in a little video we made on our constitutional problems. Regardless to say, Mulroney was losing what would be his legacy. Several years later, the group would meet again at Charlottetown, and had etched out an agreement that everyone agreed to, and everyone was willing to sign. However, New laws required a referendum to be carried out on the topic, and it failed. The referendum gave a lot of people voices. The social conservatives were upset about the failure to legislate abortion, and upset that the party had sold out to Quebec. The Quebecois nationalists were fine, 
right up until the vote failed, where they split off from the party and created the Bloc Québécois, they realized that the will of the Canadian people was aligned against Quebec's interests. While Quebec had a third of the country's population, it could only ever be a minority group. Many economic conservatives were tiring of Mulroney, whose budgets were not decreasing fast enough and sought liberal membership to try and get an economic conservative at the head of the table. When the party splintered, elements of the party left that would never return. The social conservatives, by and large, moved on to join with the Reform Party, whose open policy platform would allow their sheer numbers to control the party. The Nationalists became the Bloc Québécois, separatists, and would dominate in Quebec for a decade. The PCs diminished down to nothing under the leadership of Kim Campbell and Jean Charest. The new elements in the Liberal Party would allow them to win the 1993 federal election, reducing the PCs down to just two seats. Years later, the economic conservatives who backed Paul Martin would be involved in an intra-party feud that would bring down that party as well. But that's a story for another time.